Hello from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This is our final episode on the topic of Go. We did 9x9, nine nine, we did 13x13. 13 13. Now it's time to take the full board, the entire piece-by-piece piece strategy to at least know what we're doing on the board. It's time for the full. Let's get stuck in. Last time we dealt with the 13 by 13 board. The first episode we dealt with the nine by nine board. It's time to take the training wheels off. We're moving to the full board. So notice that it takes up a whole lot of space and I promise you it takes a second for your eyes to adjust sometimes, but the same rules apply. This is the same style board. Notice these little star points right here. There's nine and what was before this small corner of the board is almost a quarter of the board. So these little fights that you learned with the nine by nine board mean that now you can expand them elsewhere. The 13 by 13 board is sort of about a little more than halfway. So you can see how you may lose in part of the space, but also win in a greater part of the area. And notice I use those words intentionally. The space as in the small plot in the corner versus the area, the overall corner of the board. And as I said last episode, a lot of this game is developing in the corners, then the sides, then the center. When I first started playing, one of the biggest faux pas I had was, I absolutely love playing the center. Oh, let's corner that out. But then somebody would have this entire set of corners and sides, and there was nothing I could do about it. So there were pieces all over the place. So I'm just gonna loosely go over the rules one more time just explain the concept one more time and build ourselves back up before I start introducing anything new. This game is played on with stones that you are trying to create turf. You create the turf by surrounding the territory like you have right here. This is one small point of turf. You also get credit for capturing, which you do by removing all of the available liberties or spaces of movement. And then you would take it off the board and it would be your credit. Now, this game develops over time by starting with some of these little openings and then progressively building on. So um, black will always go first. White will have a certain handicap. Now you can see handicaps on the on a website for 9x9s and 13x13s, but in a full game, it's six and a half stones. Notice the half there. This game shouldn't end in a tie. What you're doing is at the end of the game, black has to be ahead in terms of available territory by six and a half, so seven. From here, you are just accounting for that advantage of going first. So let's say black decides to go here. Because you can fight for different areas at once, you actually, you don't have to go all the way over here because black can just try and surround you elsewhere. So more often than not, you typically see this at the beginning of a game where people are going after these little star points because it allows them to say, now black wants to move in. White says, okay, I'm gonna move in here. And black says, fine, I'll go here. White says, mm, well, we'll go there. This would be just directly going for it with no sense of strategy whatsoever, by the way. Okay, fine, we'll go here. And even notice as I'm playing moves that you're starting to see some slight combats that are eventually gonna form. And eventually, 
you will start seeing, well, black's got a little bit of control of the space, so they're gonna try and develop more over here. White's gonna start trying to cut things off. Black says, oh, I mean, okay, well, fine. Notice how these pieces get closer and closer over time as you start seeing a little bit more of an offense. White says, all right, you're not playing into me yet. See, now, now I'm starting to think about what moves I want. Like I said, this is a very rudimentary strategy, but as you can kind of see within the span of just a couple of moves, that there is a certain semblance of black over here is going to start trying to get control of this space at absolute minimum. White is trying to go for this general area here. So by expanding my space, notice how I'm fighting for more corners with black that white is getting scrunched in here. Because eventually what's gonna happen is black say, all right, fine, I'll go over here. Even white can do this, but then black can say, well, you're gonna have to figure out a way to get around me and around my space. So white's gonna have to start playing more offense to cut these pieces off. So notice how just in placing random pieces, I have started with some semblance of control and over time you'll be able to see on the board where am i gonna go so what i'll do is also kind of briefly let me get set back up here uh, whoop. pieces will absolutely try and escape so we'll kind of go over to the corner here and then we'll kind of review that net concept I explained where pieces can eventually get trapped as long as you're paying attention to where the available liberties are you want to push in a certain direction where they're kind of compelled to go a direction without gaining any more liberties because notice I play right here there's more liberties available so let's switch it up. Well, okay. Now there's only two liberties. Now there's one again. Now there's two. So notice how it continues to push into this situation. And black can't play here because they're already out of liberties. Now if I misplay, then there's a chance. But because Black is pretty much compelled to play. But as a reminder, especially with the ladder, you see yourself in this situation, don't go for it. Do not go for it. Just take your lumps because otherwise you're going to space. There's no space generated here. And meanwhile, when all of these get taken off the board, you've given white so much space that they can now progressively fill in and create over time these basically impenetrable eyes. And let me fill this last little bit in here. Notice you'd have to do a whole lot to break into this. And white has just been given this space for free. Don't give anything for free. So let's also talk about, I had mentioned the net as well. So, and as you become more familiar with the game, you can really start setting things up in a certain way. Uh, where now, I'm just trying to manage in giving space. That was what I was trying to do. And if black's trying to surround these without it just being a ladder, usage of here where white has, they're in danger, they've got fewer and fewer liberties, but you have more opportunities to try and 
save what you have. But the more you can cut off, the better off you're typically going to be. And this is almost like the reverse of a ladder here where white is kind of, this is one of the few moves they have to save themselves out of it. But if they continue to misplay and say, all right, well, let's create a Liberty over here. Not so fast. This one little piece played diagonally usually can be a major help to either getting you out of the jam or put you in one. So uh, the last thing that I remember we needed to talk about was the Atari situation that I had mentioned before. Add in one more. And it can be done in as simple as these kinds of moves where you, this is a decent amount of space for early game, but it can be undone by direct attack. And I'd mentioned the concept of Atari. This is a double Atari. I mentioned that in, I believe our first episode. Either here or here is gonna be captured. It's just a matter of what. And then white's gonna say, all right, fine, I'll protect here. All right, fine, that's getting captured. Now you've got two separate spaces and black has a way to start reeling you in. You can also see black moving over here to try and capture these three or trying to block off these because white will say, all right, fine, I'll just expand over here then. Okay, fine. I will keep on playing right into your hands and maybe you can get along the sides, but I'm probably gonna spend some time capturing these pieces and keeping that initiative. The more you capture, the more you're doing, the better off it is. So what I'm gonna do here is take a step back. I always like talking about the history of these games into the modern era. I'm gonna set up a couple more situations for us to look at and a couple more concepts I want you to see. And then I may bring out the nine by nine again so I can show you some just quick rudimentary counting for scoring purposes. Hold on one second, let me get set up. Last time we got to the 12th century where I started talking about the Japanese aristocracy making this an important game. Around the 14th and 16th century, we started seeing something called Go Ushi, which was an actual series of tournaments that would be organized and played through, and there would be representatives of four houses. This was probably one of the first major precursors, especially in the East, to a mind sport being a competitive event for importance, for prestige, and yes, for money. But you saw this develop into now with our modern tournaments, they are still, generally speaking, descended from these four houses to this day. So a little bit more as we start dealing with more and more complex shapes on a bigger board. So let's kind of go into where we're at now. Notice that white here is made of pretty good shape, but black here wants to try and surround it. Notice this curvature of trying to get there, but there's a good defensive structure here. There is a way typically to break just about any formation, but you have to find where you cut off the shapes. But black says, all right, I'm gonna try and attack in here. So white is absolutely gonna lose some territory here. And black says, well, I'm gonna, at this point, I wanna fill in your space because that is fewer points for you. That is, more for me to have to deal with in terms of just completing shape. And if I can surround you all the way, I get to take all of it. That would be, this would be huge if you lost this entire cluster. It happens sometimes. So Mike says, mm, no, you're, we're really not gonna play this today. Uh, Black knows that they are kind of in some trouble now because we have available liberties left these pieces are still technically considered surrounded. So at this 
juncture, it's really a question of how many more pieces you want to lose. Black cannot capture anything in here. So you have to consider not only the space do I want to use, but also the where do I go next? If I'm sitting here looking at this, I am not the best player by any stretch. I will never purport to be because this is a game you can study for years and still be learning things all the time. From here, this is okay, fine. Consider the rest of the board. If we were on a nine by nine board, I'd still be pretty happy because over here is captured, over here, I've, I'm more willing to do something like this and block off the turf. Because remember as black, you need to win by six and a half, including the uh, captured stones, which I will get to. But now you're gonna make some decisions as to, okay, what am I doing next? Where am I going? So this is where a, a plan is. And much like chess openings, there are go openings. I would highly encourage you to look at them online. You can find a bunch of common ones because this game develops into so many little minute pieces over time that it's impossible to cover even some of the basic ones. But to me, that's what gives this game a lot of replay value and is a lot of fun. So there's one or two more shapes that I want to show you before I get into some of the end game stuff. Hold on a second. All right. I want to talk about one important concept that will absolutely happen almost every single game, if not multiple times a game. Concept of Seki. It's a part of the life or death issue. If your pieces are surrounded, they're considered dead. In here, you could make an argument initially if these black pieces weren't here, that these three in the center would be dead because, well, they're fully surrounded into a corner. They're not in any sort of shape with eyes. But because black has them surrounded, technically white is also dead. Well, now here's the issue. Say it's white's turn. Well, fine, I want to capture your pieces. All black has to do is take away this one remaining liberty. And now all of those pieces are captured and removed from the board. From here, it's a notion of creating eyes and you've figured out a way. Especially once you start connecting here, this is an entire connected shape now. That's pretty difficult to do. So if you're playing as white, you absolutely do not want to play there. There's a, this is also why I mentioned last episode in particular, why it's just considered more honorable when you know a game is done to just retreat. So, uh, apologies. Oh, sorry, I had it over here. So also, as black, if you were the one to play, you would oops, flip this up. So not only do you lose three pieces, the next play that white's gonna make is here. These are eyes, there's nothing you can do to save this. So this is where, even as a strategy, you consider the concept of mutual life. Sometimes there's a part of the board that is going to be simultaneously alive and dead and probably not going to count for any sort of points at the end of the game. No, you don't get anything super advantageous. You also don't lose anything. So it's the trade-off that you make. Now, what I'm gonna do, I'll take a step back here and I wanna show you a little bit about the end game and then scoring. And I'm gonna make it simplistic. Let's bring out our friend the nine by nine board. So that way we don't have to worry about all of the complexities. Real quick, one second. All right, so it took us a while, but let's talk about scoring because I have talked about free territory and free turf. And what I can go ahead and tell you is that currently white's winning. How do we know that? Well, we have to consider the spaces that are, air quotes, completely surrounded in some concept, and this is usually an agreed upon concept by the white player. So here as a point, each point counts as one point. 
one, two, three, four, five, six. This is contested right here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So right here, there's 28 points. And I need you to consider the rule of handicap. Usually in a nine by nine board, it's not six and a half. It's usually something like two and a half or one and a half, depending on the agreement. Let's say for the sake of conversation that it's one and a half. So black just needs to win by two. Let's see what black has. This is gonna be the same kind of contested. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. This is not gonna count, I don't believe. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Okay, correct. Because here has some open space as contested. So right now it's 28 to 25. How are we gonna fix this? Pretty easy. It's Black's turn to play. They're gonna start encroaching upon this space. This removes these points from consideration. White says, no, 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 we're, we're not gonna do that. You're, you're not gonna be able to effectively do that. And Black says, all right, fine, cool. We'll just agree that your space is in. White's like, okay, okay, fine. White says, all right, well, I'm gonna play here. I'm gonna try and Put a nice little attack in here. Black says, well, how about we go after your pieces too? This is, no, we're not playing this game. Black says, all right, fine. White's gonna encroach here one more time. And Black says, not so fast, my friend. So there was a little bit of space loss, but now this has been solidified. Let's count again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Notice how even with trying to go on the attack, there was at least two points lost here. Now, obviously that wasn't played, air quotes, perfectly. But because of that, there was at least a swing. If let's say for the sake of conversation that black had been over here, well, that prevents white from getting any further. Now we go from that wasn't any free space here, but that's a point gained. Let's say they played even worse and had to maybe put something here for safety. That keeps taking away points. So this is also why as a player, if you've figured out your spot, okay, I have no more moves I can make and you probably have no more you can probably make, but the person who you're playing against is entitled to make more moves. But it's not like at this point you could play here because that'd be a capture. What's the point? That's just adding in. Especially because at the end of the game, let's say there were some stones captured here. At the end of the game, what you would actually do, and remember it was 26 to 25. So we're just gonna keep this as is. So from here, it's gonna be 24, and usually you can just place it anywhere on the board that makes it look nice. So now we're down to 23. Well, now let's look at white. 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. So now it's 23 to 21 as this game has ended. Remember how I said the handicap was 1.5? This means that Black has won by 0.5 stones, getting past that handicap. This is a fairly simplistic way to keep score, and it's better for you to have agreed upon, okay, this space is alive, this space is dead. In the last segment when I talked about mutual life, consider that dead, it's no points for anybody because it has to be clear coverage like it was elsewhere. So this is 
in a nutshell, the way that scoring works. And once you add it to a larger board, sometimes the point totals can get a pretty, pretty nutty. But in the end, more often than not, it's also easier to say, okay, as you're playing this game, you can kind of keep track of how much space you have versus how much space they have. More often than not though, this is the basics of scoring and it doesn't typically deviate from this. Now, let me take a step back because I want to show you a little bit about shapes and we'll go back to the big board one more time before we head out because I think it's important to show the value of playing not just in the corners, but why you want to make certain shapes work. Hold on a sec. All right, welcome back to the big board. I wanna show you an example of why it's probably a good idea to fight for the corners, then the sides, then the center. I've made some formations here that all are considered living territory. All of them use eight stones. All of them have different points. I'll go with the corner and work my way in. So this is eight stones on A, B, C, D, E. One, two, three, four. So E, one through four, and uh, five. So A, B, C, D, all on five. Now I want you to take a second to count the points. One, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 points that are protected by eight stones. Is it the most secure thing in the world? No, but this is where the efficiency of your pieces comes into play. Let's do another example. This is along the side. This is over here, two guarding and four on the end. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight stones but only eight points compared to 16. This is where space really comes into play. Let's make it even worse. Two sets of two all in the middle. That will need securing at some point with eyes. And that's only four points. So as you are starting to make shapes, play along the outsides, see what you can kind of get in your world first, and then be able to push towards the center because towards the end game, let's assume that you're really going after this space. So I'm gonna just combine these right here. You can use the same number of stones to create even more space. So notice the 16 over here. You've already used this to wheel it in. That's another one, two, three, four, five points. Even by already making this connection, you've got, you can even make it six. You can even make it seven. Eight's kind of stretching it, but notice how the wider you have your space and the more defended and effective control you have. There we go, that's what I was looking for. So notice this is another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the same as this, you can actually if you have this all connected, you're actually well set up for the end game. But here, and let's say here, now look how many points you've got secured. All because you have managed to find and acquire your turf. Let me just make that a little more. So same 24 stones, which would have been um, 28 points is now, so it's 16, that's eight, so that's 24. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44. Same number of stones, 28 versus 44 points. This is why as you're playing, see the shapes that you're making. Let me set up some example shapes too so you can see what I mean, especially when you're trying to make eyes using small number of stones, but securing your space. One second, let me get it set up. How did this game get from China, Japan, an important game, to the West? Uh, over time, as cultural development started being shared in the 17th 
18th centuries, uh, you started seeing a little bit of movement along the Silk Road, along the uh, Portuguese who would be able to open trade. This board game start to be exported a little bit. You actually saw one of the first large board game booms. This is a relatively easy game to produce. You just need a flat piece, you need points, and you need stones, and you're pretty much good to go. So, in the German and Austro-Hungarian empires, you actually saw a significant boom of these board games to be produced, and a lot of fairly good players. Treatises on the time, board games have always been one of those popularity pastimes. Go was no exception. So a couple more things I wanna talk about before we go. So I've talked a lot about making eyes and keeping alive and marking off your territory. So here are a bunch of examples and we can kind of lightly go through all of them, but in general, all of these are considered alive because unless you can completely surround these pieces, you're probably not capturing them. Notice here in the corner, this only required six pieces and it's two points of turf within nine points of play. Not bad. This is about the most efficient you can be. Uh, similar over here, uh, similar over here. Oh, I missed a stone. This is what happens by the way, is occasionally you miss a stone when you're setting up stuff. So in the corner, out of nine points of play, if you can get seven, you can make two eyes. So notice as you move around the board, just take a look at stuff requires eventually, this requires eight, this requires 10, but it's out in the middle where you have to protect from more and more angles over time. So what you probably wanna practice within the context of playing these games is find ways to make eyes efficiently. And this is why it pays so well to start in the corners because no one's getting past this. Even if you had white pieces surrounding all of this on all of these points, go ahead and set it up so you can see. You still have two living eyes within it. So I talked about uh, mutual life as a general concept, but here, because you've got pieces that are specifically surrounded, I mean, great, they've surrounded you, but that is not worth any points. This is. So by making as large of a turf space as you can in a protected way, there are, all of these are two points. No matter what, they're two points. But the way you can do it efficiently and collectively over the course of an entire game. This is why I always suggest start on a nine by nine. If you get a three by three covered and you've got two points completely surrounded, that's a decent chunk of the board already covered in your territory. And if you do it with an, an efficient method over the course of time, you're gonna be doing all right. So one last, one last thing that I wanna show you before we go. Oh, it'll take me a minute to set it up, but I wanna show you what it would look like to have things all over the board. And you can kind of see the direction of where you'd like to go in terms of just a general strategy. One second. So I went ahead and kind of played just a rudimentary game, trying to follow the rules of going after the corners first, then the sides, then the center. Notice that I've hardly played at all in the center. The closest I've gotten are this set of pieces right here or this little setup right here. So if you're playing as black, you've got to consider what turf you're trying to get. Notice this little white piece is kind of lost out of here. This is where um, once you play this piece and it gets surrounded like that, it just consider it dead. You can allow it to move on and it, I promise you, it can be okay because you may lose this piece at most, but it doesn't mean you waste your time trying to save it unless, see these pieces over here? If you manage to, in later games, start making a turn and are able to successfully 
I'll just make a rudimentary here. Get inside. Now you've got better options to try and eventually, obviously, Black would be playing to get right back around. But notice here, that is the setup structure where you're along the sides and in the corner. And eventually, leave that one here. You do have options, but notice how for a lot of these pieces, they're not placed right next to each other, except for these ones where I'm kind of trying to create a string of pieces. For black, I'd, I'd like to shore up this part at some point, but I think one of the best things you could play right now, just with this rudimentary setup, is actually gonna be up here. Because this is one of the only places that white has free and clear contested, and white will not exactly want to give that space up easy. So white will say, all right, let's just move in for the corner here. This is where these little fights really come into play. Oh, sorry. White's gonna work on connecting, but notice how black's really only gonna be able to do so much, even if white really tries to cut in. Now you're starting to connect pieces. All right, white's gonna continue trying to play over here. But if these pieces continue to start becoming dead, um, try to keep this shape here. Oh, all right. Black says, all right, fine. You know, do, do what you will. But the most you're gonna do is take some of this territory and eventually white's gonna try squig around but start getting boxed in. Notice how we've already rudimentarily created a ladder effect just from this. White has to spend so much time trying to push in that if they make a mistake, and let's say they play here, now black can really start hemming it in. I'll play here and kind of realize their goof. But now at most, they can try and connect over here. And generally speaking, black now has an opportunity to get in between these pieces. So they may play all the way over here. And even if whites can take that piece, all right, fine. Keep playing there because I can play over here. Just in those immediate moves, whites now hemmed in. Black has all of this area as its own considered living and you can continue playing then along the sides. Shore up over here. Try and maybe cut into white over here. White's playing on the defensive now. They're probably gonna have to start going over here. They're losing this fight and they're aware of this. So, okay, try something different. This is, once you get up to this level, being able to play on a large board, you're really gonna start seeing the patterns and things you're gonna wanna go after, which, makes this game has it has a lot of challenge but once you learn it it's one of the most rewarding games when you can pull off a large victory doesn't happen all the time but when it does boy does it feel good so where is the game of go today it retains a certain level of popularity um, i started playing about 10 years ago so it's one of those things that you just kind of pick up along the way when you learn board games and diversify your board game portfolio. You also see with computing, uh, similar to how chess had Deep Blue, Go had AlphaGo, which was a computer that eventually was able to beat professional players. It took a while because of the complexity of this game. There are so many little opportunities and rule sets that you have to take your time with it. But that is where things currently are now with the computers have caught up. If you ever need an opportunity to learn more, I highly recommend looking up the tournaments that are actually not only televised in Japan, but they have commentators of great Go players. Cho Shakun is one of my favorites who will actively talk about the game as they're playing. You can find some subtitles usually for most of these, but it's really cool to see 
these modern players not only do really well against each other, then go up against a computer and lose. That is all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to tune in next time where we're gonna flip the script a little and we're gonna go into a six part series on tabletop gaming. Prepare for Dungeons and Dragons. In the meantime, be sure to check out some of our other great NPL Universe content on our YouTube page. Also, as a reminder, board games are available for checkout at your local branch to place a hold or stop in. See you next time. Thank you.